Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and this week we are in the new Graham and Dunn with their owner and founder, Alan Galen. Alan, thank you for inviting us actually back into your kit. This is the third time we've had a conversation. I know, we're veterans, aren't we? I know, we got good at this. <laughs> All right, so this is part of a larger concept called Bread and Butter. It is. What is Bread and Butter? Our goal with Bread and Butter was really just to bring some unique, community-involved, value-priced restaurants into the market. I think that must be the magic formula. Community-involved, value-priced, and unique concepts. I would say that's the hallmark of bread and butter. That's what we do. Um, it, it is the two things that really, I think, separate us from some of the other competition out there. Um, you know, everything that we do is community involved, you know, pretty much um, from supporting the charities to supporting the local communities to su really supporting the neighborhood. You know, we believe in, we want to be neighborhood restaurants. We want people in this market to come to our restaurants because they live close by mm -hmm. and they like supporting local mm -hmm. and they like what we do. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing with the economy the way it is, you know, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? Price of oil goes up, price of oil goes down, commodities moving. People have to watch their P's and Q's, but they're so much smarter now than they were um, years ago. They're much more um, savvy consumers than they used to be. Absolutely. And they want more for their money. So, you know, the value piece, you know, can be described in a lot of ways, whether it's, you know, it's a better price or whether it's a better um, experience that they're having. One of the two, we want to try and provide that and fit into their, their financial means where they can come eat with us you know, whether it's bread and butter, I mean, whether it's BRGR mm -hmm. um, at a lower price point or urban table kind of in the middle mm -hmm. or here a little bit higher, but still certainly not high price. No, at all, so. no. OK, so let's talk then oh, BRGR, if you will, gourmet hamburgers at a, a value price, urban table. We pay to visit there, and it's really about what's fresh, what's local, and make it happen that day. You can eat there, you can grab something and take it on the go. Really addressing the way we live today with Urban Table. It is. To Graham and Dunn on the plaza. What's the concept here? Yeah, the concept here is what we um, describe as Kansas City's original gastropub. Uh, okay. Because gastropub's kind of a new term it's for us. It's a new so term in the mean? Midwest a little bit. You know, it comes from Chicago, New York, San Francisco, the big cities. Um, but what it really, really evolved from was in um, Europe and, you know, Ireland and Scotland and England especially was where so many pubs are. And all these pubs have evolved over the course of time. Yes. And they didn't really have great food. They were about going in and drinking pints and, you know, having right. some fun. And, um, you know, these owners started getting smarter and wiser, and they were okay. like, if we had better food, we'd do better. And then, then we brought in a notoriety chef, and he could really create cool pub food. It would even be better. And then, you know, that really took on a new life over there. And then the um, Americans got hold of it yes, and did. brought it over here. Uh, chef Bradley is from uh, North Carolina, yeah. so uh, we've got a, a few influences from the, from the South. But it's all American mm -hmm. food done with a bit of a flair. A bit of a flair, which I know we're doing today. I mean, we are doing a double pork chop. And I think Chef has done a wonderful job of taking that comfort food and kicking it up a notch. Yeah, and somebody said it, um, it was uh, fancy comfort food. Fancy comfort food. And that I works. thought that was a good way to, to describe it. You've had the training to do what you're doing. What, weren't you Gilbert Robinson man for a while? I was. I actually came, they had already turned and changed to Houlihan's Restaurant Houlihan's. Group at that time, but it was the Gilbert Robinson Company, and I spent uh, eight years there, and uh, ultimately was the Chief Operating Officer, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I had some experience in, in the so big business. world, in okay. the big, big company world. And, and, the, and, and uh, the business end of it, because the restaurant is more than a chef, although certainly a huge piece of it, absolutely. but it's, you've got to have both. You, you do, you put do. Put together the magic formula, it's working. It's working, it's going good. I got great people, and that's really the key, it. you know, yep. I mean, you know, the corporate background is uh, is good. It's, it's you, you got to have the business sense to be able to sure. do it. And you have to have a bit uh, of understanding of all that because we invest a lot of money. We want our money back. We yeah. want to make money. Don't don't get us wrong there. But um, 
it's really about the people in this business. You know, you got to have great people. It's long, hard, it's grueling hard. hours. It is. Yep. Um, and these these folks are talented and they're passionate about what they do. And I'm very fortunate to have them on my team. And, and the show's on the play. I think it's time for us to now go talk to your chef. Absolutely. And hear about his work, his inspiration, yep. his journey. And then we're going to go into the kitchen and make that double pork chop. Absolutely. Okay. It's been so. a fun journey and uh, he'll give you some good insight to, uh, to the menu and what he's doing. Okay. All Thank right. you, Ellen, for inviting us back into your kitchen. My pleasure. <laughs> Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabakoff. We're going to continue our chat with the chef segment here at Graham and Dunn on the Plaza with their executive chef, Bradley Gilmore. Bradley, thank you for inviting us into your kitchen. Thanks for coming, Bonnie. Okay. All right. So let's talk about your journey to this kitchen. My journey to this kitchen um, started with BRGR, really, uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, met with Alan Galen. Uh, came into BRGR, helped with that project, started Urban Table, got that project going on before we could even open the doors. Busy. We had Graham and Dunn under, going under our belt, and uh, we did that concept, and here we are today on the plaza with Graham and Dunn. Okay, where did you get your training? I trained at Johnson County Community College, and I apprenticeship under uh, Chef Michael Peterson. You know, so we've talked about Chef Michael Peterson before. What an extraordinary experience for you, and I hear from chefs all the time. Training, absolutely important. The chef you study under, vital. He is so creative and so what was that like being it was a lot uh, an of, apprentice under yeah, Chef Yeah, it was Michael. a lot of fun. It was hard work. Um, I had never worked. In he's a, crazy. Jim. He is crazy. He's crazy. Can't help it. Yeah. I had never worked in a kitchen before, and uh, he told me sink or swim were his words. And so <laughs> I came insane. to Grand Street Cafe, and when I started cooking, I just realized that day one that it was something that I wanted to do and I could do. Oh, and wonderful. And uh, I just kept going and going and going, and uh, it's led us back here to the plaza. It's you're back here to the plaza once again. All right, so training at JUCO, um, apprenticeship, internship with Chef with Chef Michael, who's amazing, and now you've you've helped with the concepts for three of Alan Galen's the bread and butter company. When we talked about that, he has created a magic formula. Here we are in a, a challenging economic time. Antifa's having successes with this magic formula of his. What is your concept for? I know you drive this menu. What is your concept for Graham and Dunn? Our Graham and Dunn concept, um, it's really comfort food that you're comfortable with, with a twist on it. Comfort um, food that you're comfortable with, with a twist. I love it. Um, and from all regions. Um, a lot of people will classify as Southern because I'm from North Carolina. There's a lot of Southern things and on the menu. you brought that with you. I brought that southern, with me. Yes. I did. Um, but we try not to just be Southern. We try to take a lot of things. We've got gougeres and mussels and things from all kinds of reasons, pierogies and poutines from Canada. But we really just try to take things that you're going to be able to read on the menu, mm -hmm. understand what they are. And right. when you get them, you may think, oh, that's a little different than what I thought. But when you taste it, it's a very comfortable feeling in your mouth and taste. Okay, so what is your inspiration for this work? I mean, you're, so you're taking comfort food and you're really kicking it up a couple of notches. How do you get inspired to do this? Well, what it, I didn't really ever cook professionally in North Carolina, so when we started this project, uh -huh. I took everything that I knew mm -hmm. from my grandmother teaching me how to cook and I use a lot of my granny's recipes and it, things right now. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful, that continuation of the generations and preserving what was special from your childhood for somebody else now? They're gonna exactly. Yep. 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 Um, so I take some of that and I take the, the, yeah, from that. Granny. I call I her all that. the time and my pastry chef laughs at me because she thinks I want her to be my Granny and uh, I told her I'd have to send her out there and let her cook with her for a little while. But, okay. uh, You're very we, uh, fortunate, yeah. So I take what I've learned here in Kansas City um, and what I learned in school and I take my Southern, you know, heritage and add them together and that's what we come up with. Okay, so really inspiration. Granny was a, a significant piece mm -hmm. of that. All right, as executive chef, you are also providing leadership in the kitchen as you had the opportunity to work under executive chefs. Now you are providing that experience for other cooks. Yeah, I have, what, um, what? I have a team of chefs and cooks here. We have uh, two chefs, Nathan Nichols and Lauren Martin. They're both from Kansas City um, and worked at some great restaurants. But, you know, we're grooming them to be executive chefs so that come our fourth concept, we're ready to go and move to the next one. Amazing. All right. So what, what are you trying to impart to these people? What do you want them? 
What kind of experience do you, when you say grooming them for executive chef, how are you doing that? Um, I start with having a good time with cooking. Um, I try not to make it too serious. Um, we like to have fun, um, but there's also, it's way more than just food. There's a business sense to it as well. Okay. Everything has to, you have to think about how the customer is going to take it to how the business is going to deal with it. Um, so that's something that I'm teaching them right now. They can cook. They can cook really well. So we just really work on the other aspects of things, all the other little things that go into the day in the life in the kitchen. And at the end of the day, it's all about the experience that your customers, your diners yep. have here at the restaurant. At the end of the day, the only thing that matters is if the customer were happy when they left and a goal and a goal yeah <laughs> that's your goal that's, that's, your, our, that's goal. our goal okay chef what are we going to make today in the kitchen today we're going to do the double bone-in breaded pork chop mm. um, it's big it's about a pound it's hope you're hungry no one's going to go away hungry no mm -hmm. uh, and what are we going to serve with that creamed brussels sprouts with bacon the bacon we smoke in house um, we fire the brussels sprouts to order every time and then we make a um, a pork reduction that we pour over the pork top okay all right, this is serious. Now, pork chop, I mean, we do we do look at Southern, and some people turn their nose at Brussels sprouts. I have a feeling that you will be converted to a Brussels sprout lover before this is the over with, thing about which I am a lover of Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Okay, I think you and I should go into the kitchen and prepare the signature dish. Let's do and, it. And I think you should come with us. and done with their executive chef Bradley Gilmore we are going to make our double bone-in bread and pork chop cream Brussels sprouts house smoked bacon and a natural jus I think we should begin chef where should we do that well we've got our uh, double pork chop here with French down it's about a pound um, we've uh, marinated olive oil a little bit of herbs and salt and pepper and slow cooked it for three hours okay now let's talk about that so how long did you marinate the pork chop we marinate it for overnight, and okay. then we'll... And, but at least a couple of hours. A couple hours, hours. A couple yeah, two or three hours, hours is great. Um, if you have it overnight, it's even better. Okay, now tell me what you did after you marinated. You slow cooked it we in... We slow cooked it in uh, under vacuum seal, under a controlled environment. Okay, is that called sous vide? It is called sous vide. It's called sous vide. All right, and I'm told the positives of sous vide is you cook it all the way through so that when you're doing the rest of the cooking, you don't have to dry the you meat don't have out. To dry the meat out. I'll just bet you this pork chop will not be dried out. I bet it won't I either. I bet funny. it won't either. Okay, all right, so sous vide marinated and what next? What next? We have a little bit of seasoned flour here, and we just give it a light, a light dredging on it here. Tell me how you season the flour. Uh, we've got salt, pepper in here. Yes. Regular flour, all-purpose yes. flour. A yes. little bit of cornstarch, ah. uh, and some Creole seasoning. Cornstarch gives it a nice texture. Mm, I can smell the Creole I in can there. Smell the Creole. Okay. So that gives it a nice edge. So we get it breaded all the way around. Get those bones. Get everything. And what I have behind me here is a really hot cast iron pan. And as you know, a lot of uh, southern cooking starts with the cast iron, so this is one of our southerner style dishes on here. Which you brought with you from Granny. I bet I Granny did. cooked several things in her cast iron. She does. Salad. Lots of cast iron cooking here. Okay. So what we do here first, we just get it nice and hot and we put it in there. Okay. And are we are wanting to sear it. We want to sear it and get the breading cooked on both sides and then we're going to finish it in the oven. I think what's important is that the bone becomes part of the dish. I mean, you have floured that bone. You have seasoned that bone because I have actually seen people chewing on bones. I mean, that is exactly. a human thing to do. It is a human thing to do is chew on thing. that bone. If you don't have sous vide equipment or you don't want to do the vacuum seal, could you poach the pork chop? I would slow roast it in the oven first. Slow roast. I'd get it a whole rack, you know, or size rack you get from your butcher. Rub it down, marinate it overnight. Slow roast it in your oven for a couple hours. Get it to about mid rare. Then cut it, sear it, bread it. All right. And you're good to so go. it can be simple enough at home. It can be simple enough at home. Okay. What we're going to do is just give it a little bit of cook on each side here. Get it a little bit of cooking going on all the way around this thing. Okay. All right. All right. Pork chop has been marinated. We've either slow roasted it or we've done a sous vide. We browned it. We've got some caramelization going and it's cooking now in the oven. So for the side, which is the Brussels sprouts, what this is your mise en place. This is what here. What do we have here? We, is, have, we have our, our Brussels that we've cut the core out and cut in half and then lightly blanched to where they're they're firm but not soft. All right, so a little bit of salt water. You want it to be bright green. You want it to be bright green, yep. Bright green. Okay, and what do we have here? 
Pecorino cheese, mm. Pecorino Romano, um, heavy whipping cream. That's serious. That is yes, serious stuff serious right stuff. there. Okay. Um, and this is a house smoked bacon that we smoke in house here. Mm. That's why it tastes so good. So get a nice thick bacon at the store that's been smoked. Okay. All right, and then salt and pepper for everything. Salt and pepper for everything. So what are we going to start with? We're going to start by preheating a pan here. Okay. Get it nice and hot. That's really important. We forget to do that. Don't it put is. ingredients in a cold pan. No, in a cold too. oven. You know, even your toaster oven at home. If you're going to do something like you do it in your oven, preheat it first. You know what? That's a great point, and I never thought about it, and now I now I know. I, I have to okay. make myself do it at home because we use those things to be quicker at stuff, but it's very important. You'll find that your items come out a lot better. Preheat it. Yep. Okay. Um, house smoked bacon. Uh, the reason you want to start with that is yes. so that you can leach out some of that fat. Um, get some of that flavor getting out of there. You've got that in your hot pan. The bacon's already cooked, so you're not really trying to cook the bacon. You're just trying to warm it back up and get it to leach out some of its fat. All right, so now we're going to add our cream now that we have a hot pan with the bacon in there. See how the cream's starting to reduce? That is what we want there. We forget you can reduce cream the same way you can stock or any other Anything liquid. Else, yep. It intensifies the flavor. It thickens it up without using flour. Right, correct. It's and you got all flavors, yeah. just all flavor all the time. All flavor all the time. All flavor all the time. Then we take our Brussels sprouts. They're gorgeous. Pour those in there. Look how beautiful that vegetable is when it's been cooked properly. Properly, yeah. It's not all brown. A little bit of the, uh, about a tablespoon of the pecorino. That's going to thicken it up, make it glaze those Brussels sprouts. You know, this is just taking minutes. You have all the, you have all the ingredients prepped, and we forget that you can make wonderful food happen at home by just a little planning. Just a little planning. Yep. Yep. So that's reduced. What next? All right, now that the cream is reduced and it's coating the Brussels sprouts, about a tablespoon of butter we throw in there. And you know, you, and, and it's coming at the end, and the order in which you introduce these ingredients really plays a big role in how the dish comes out. Correct. And you didn't have to use that much butter. No, not that much, uh, not at all. And you can cut it back a little bit at home if you'd like to use a little less than that. Um, you don't have to use any at all, but it gives that extra richness that you're looking for. Um, one of the main things we do in the kitchen here is we have tasting spoons, and we'd like to taste everything. Um, we should taste it right before it goes out, right? Uh, yep, yep, yep. There you go. I like to get a little bit of the bacon, a little leaf of the Brussels. Okay. That way I'm not eating someone's whole dinner. No, just part of it. Just part of it. Okay. You know, the other important thing is at home, taste the food before you serve it in the taste same it. way you do here. All it takes is a little bit of salt and pepper, a little bit of love, and you're really good to go. We eat with our eyes first. So, Chef, how do we plate this signature dish? We've got our Brussels sprouts here that we creamed up. And you reminded me, please don't overcook your Brussels sprouts. Never overcook don't your Brussels sprouts. Do you that. want them a little bit crunchy. Al dente is the word for that. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do here is we plate them all on one side of the dish, create a little separation between the chop, the cream, and the sauce that we put on the, the pork chop itself. You know, when you come to Graham and Dunn, you better come hungry. You better come hungry. You better come hungry. They're big plates, very big generous. portions. Yes. Very generous. All right, so we've got our Brussels sprouts there. Uh, yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Next. Now we have our chop that we uh, seared and we put in the oven. We're going to sit that guy on here. That guy's ready to go. A little tilt there for presentation. <laughs> Um, a little high, yeah, this yeah a little high. to the diner, and I promise you they'll be chewing. Mm, they they'll do. They'll be chewing on the bone. Okay. Um, what now, we have what here, is this, this yeah. is a um, pork shoe that we make after we make a ham stock reduction, or stock. Yes. And then we reduce it with red wine, garlic, and fresh herbs. So what you've done is you've made what would be the equivalent of chicken soup, only you made it with ham. Ham, ham hocks. So ham yep. hocks, you've got a ham hock soup. Yep. If you will, and then you reduce it to intensify the flavors and add some more yummy. Oh. Exactly. Reduce down the wine, reduce down the stock, a little garlic, fresh herb. I smell that. I smell the wine. Yep, and that's right. our pork chop. Thank you once again for inviting us into your kitchen. I think we need to go from here to the bar, have the sommelier pair this with some wine, and then invite our celebrity taster in to taste it. Sounds like a good idea to me, Bonnie. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and we have just been in the kitchen at Graham and Dunn with their executive chef. We've made one of his signature dishes. 
a double pork chop with a cream sauce, and Brussels sprouts, and bacon. A lot of complex flavors going on. What to drink with that? To answer the question, we're going to talk with the wine sommelier here, Michael Schurzberg. Michael, what should we drink with this dish? Well, there's a couple routes that you can go with that. Uh, generally, when I'm taking a look at Bradley's food, I look at how the ingredients work together okay. and what we have. So a lot of people like whites, a lot of people like reds, so I, I came up with a pairing for each for a white. I've got a Vouvray, so it's all Chenin Blanc from the Loire Valley in yes. France. Domaine Hue is probably the top producer in Vouvray. And Lo Lu, it's a Vouvray sec, so dry Vouvray, single vineyard site. They've had this property since the 50s. And you get a lot of yellow apple character here, you get a lot of acid. And that acid's important because it's going to break through any of the fat in the dish, the cream and whatnot, and it plays off of the Brussels sprouts without making them too vegetal. On to a red. So okay, so a, this is our wine. Yes. Yeah, and you would serve this chilled? Yes. Okay. And not, and not ice cold, but chilled. Chilled. Okay. And then for a red, uh, Pinot Noir is pretty food friendly, yeah. generally works well. Shenan is a great little boutique producer in Oregon, and 2009 was such a phenomenal vintage that I don't really worry about getting a single vineyard site with the 2009 Oregon Pinots. Oh, okay. This is a, a great value, and it gives you that kind of earthy, mushroomy forest floor character that works so well with the flavors of that dish. Well, Michael, what we're going to do from here is we've invited a celebrity taster in to taste the food and sip the wine. We're going to hear what she has to say about this. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and we have been in the kitchen at Grand and Dunn preparing a signature dish. We went to the bar to pair it with wine, and to taste this creation is our celebrity taster, Anita Maltbia. She is the director of the Green Impact Zone in Kansas City. Anita, thank you for sharing this time with us. Hi, and Bonnie. All, yeah, we've sat together before in front yeah. of a television camera. <laughs> exactly. It's been a few years ago. We won't mention how no. many. No, 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 no. no. Well, gentlemen, what have you prepared for our celebrity taster? Today we have our double bone-in breaded pork chop over uh, creamed Brussels sprouts and bacon and a little natural jus. Okay, mm. and what should we drink with this? Well, a couple rounds we can go with. The white, what I have is Domaine Hue Vouvray Sec Le 2010. So it's a Chenin Blanc grape from the Loire Valley, kind of yellow apple character to it, a lot of acid. It helps to kind of cut through any of the fat that you find mm -hmm. with pork and with the cream Brussels sprouts. And then for people who prefer red, I have Chenin Pinot Noir 2009 from Oregon. It's a small boutique producer, kind of Burgundian in style, so kind of earthy, mushroomy, forest floor characteristics here. Works well with the, the earthy components in the dish. Okay, chef and sommelier have been busy, and now we need to taste their creation. Yeah, okay. Right. okay, gentlemen, thank you. Okay, hurry up because I'm impatient. <laughs> Looking forward oh, to it. Oh, yeah, we dig it to the... Oh, mm. double, as if one wasn't enough. Oh, my goodness. Chef is... It's pretty, too. It's pretty, because mm. you know what? We do eat with our eyes first. Mm -hmm. And if you ever oh. thought you did, oh, huh? oh, didn't my. like Brussels sprouts... Mmm. Yummy? Mmm. 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 Wow. That's fabulous. You know? He got the crispiness, mm -hmm. and it is still moist, juicy, and yes. tender. Yeah, it's now, so flavorful. My gosh. He's good. You know what? I was on a diet five minutes ago. <laughs> you can be on a diet again. <laughs> Just not at this moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Ooh, that's good. Did you notice the Brussels sprouts? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. I like Brussels sprouts. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to love these. Mm-hmm. Mm. You will because there's a little bit of cream, not a lot of cream. Mm hmm And there's little bits of bacon. You know, bacon goes a long way. It has great flavor. You don't need much of it. I think it's a food group. Oh, Nobody asked me, but I do. It is a food uh -huh. group. I mean, what is not good or better with bacon? Really? Nothing. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm going to bring my husband to get this. I know you will. Mm -hmm. Gary so appreciative, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. It's delicious. Now, your assignment's not over. Okay. No, you have to sip the wine. Mm -hmm. All right. You know what? 
so you want Let's to start with red beauty, but somebody has to someone's got to do it, and you can. And so to your health, same to you, and to life, same to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. He wasn't kidding about the apple. That's and you very know, nice. you do put apple with pork yeah, frequently, and look how that works. Yeah, I like that. All right, so it's does this light. mean? You have to take another bite. See, but it had to stand up to the Brussels sprouts and the pork. Right. And so you take another bite, mm -hmm. and then you sip the red wine. Because okay. you have to make sure. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That. That's delicious. Mm-hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. now it's red wine time. Not rushing you. No. Mm-hmm. Too. So that's why for the red wine lovers, mm -hmm. really he's right, it stands up to this pork chop mm -hmm. and to the bacon and the vegetable, which is your preference or do you have one? Yeah, you know, I guess I'm not a true connoisseur because There's no I such like thing, it's just whatever you whatever like. Whatever you like. Whatever you like. Yeah, I really like the, I like the fruity taste of that white Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. That really was good. that was delicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking of green, as I'm looking at the Brussels sprouts, mm -hmm. you have before you the leadership which you have exhibited over again many years that we won't talk about that number of civic leadership in Kansas City, and you're doing so again with this green project. What is it about? Well, you know, it's dealing with a part of our city that has suffered disinvestment for a long time, mm -hmm. really about 40 years or so. That's a long time. A and long what, time. what part of the city, 39th to? 39th to 51st Street, and Troost on the west, and Prospect on the east. Okay, so and what are we doing with this? What is our goal for this area? It's to work with and through five neighborhoods that make up this area mm -hmm. to raise the quality of life for the residents. And the platform is energy efficiency and environmental conservation. That's green. That's green. That's green. Mm -hmm. The overarching vision of the neighborhood leaders mm -hmm. is that the quality of life in general be raised. And one of the things that's really been realized in the last several years is that if you've had major disinvestment over a long period of time, you yes. have to take a holistic approach. And ours has eight different strategies, so we are holistically working with and through these folks. I know we're spending time, because of the economic situation, identifying the unhappiness around the job situ situation, education, health care. Mm -hmm. It is inspiring to know that your program, and I know that there are others, are doing something about it. Yes. And in, as you described, a holistic, a holistic approach. You know, we have many things to celebrate in this city, not the least of which is the arts. You've been part yes. of Young Audiences. Yes. The Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts has also been a part of who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm. And we have chefs. I know. We have and chefs. Then, then I get to eat like and this. And then you get to eat like this. <laughs> These chefs are amazing. Fabulous. Kansas City, they always say, oh, you know, barbecue. And we do that well, too. Mm -hmm. But we do many other things. We really do. We do. This we really is do. just and I'm just amazing. happy to contribute by eating this. It's <laughs> <laughs> the least you could do. Anita. So, mm -hmm. we've been sitting next to each other for some time now. Mm -hmm. Started out doing a news show together. We won't say how long ago that was either. Right. With city government. It was and so much fun. It was. It really was. It was fun. It was. It's just yeah. all about our community anyway yes. and how we care for it. I want to thank you. I know you're very busy. You have a huge task in front of you. You are the one to be doing it. And I think that spirit of collaboration that you bring to everything you do is going to be vital for this work, and you're going to make it happen. Thank you, Bonnie. It's, you know, it's really the people. And all about the people, and yeah. I'm just happy to have the opportunity to be a part of it. Well, you deserve this pork chop. Yes, I do. <laughs> Eat and enjoy. <laughs> <laughs>
Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and this week we are back in the cellar with Marquis Selections and their managing director, Chris Cribb. We're going to talk about what to pair with some of our favorite comfort foods. Chris, thank you for inviting us back into your cellar. Sure, Bonnie, great to have you. And, and a wonderful cellar this is at the American Restaurant. Yes, well, we just got done celebrating New Year and mm -hmm. wanted to uh, to show off uh, one of our Kansas City's favorites here and yes. go ahead and talk a little bit about some special winter fare and those, those hearty dishes that we're going to be having while it's a little colder. It's a little colder, so let's talk out with a favorite, and that is mac and cheese which is more complicated than first blush because you can go from a sharp cheddar to for your mac and cheese sure, absolutely. to a blue cheese you may have a a crumble topping that includes garlic and bacon and so what do you suggest for these varieties well you know mac and cheese i think is a great great favorite because you can make a lot of it at one time mm -hmm. and you know, feed quite a few people. When you're thinking about your wine pairing, mm -hmm. you want to look at what you're going to put in it. Okay. Uh, second thing I like to look at is, are you going to be doing a big crust on it? Or are you going to be Probably. doing it kind of... <laughs> It's kind of nice because it gives you that different Correct. texture. Oh, it does. And, you know, yeah. that, that really helps. The wine that I chose for mac and cheese today um, specifically is the uh, the Caparota Macabeo, which okay. is a, a white wine from the center part of Spain. Mm -hmm. and Macabeo is a grape that is known for being very smooth, soft, uh, easy to drink, uh, a little lighter in alcohol. Uh, it is um, got a little bit of a nutty character to it mm -hmm. and uh, kind of a floral for peach flavor. Okay, so good with cheddar. So it goes really good, good with, that with cheddar, cheddar flavor. And the Parmesan would be that good Parmesan with that? Parmesan really goes well with okay. it as well. You know, if you get that um, mm. kind of crust on it that mm -hmm. where you, you've taken the breadcrumbs and then you we put the you Parmesan on top of them mm -hmm. and it's made mm -hmm. that, that secondary crust, you know, you'll, you'll find that, that this will cut through it, kind of cleanse your palate so that you're ready for, it takes the richness out of it. Okay, and um, makes you ready for that next bite. Absolutely. It does, so. okay. Do you help? Okay. Welcome to the new year. Thank you, too. So we see that this has got you know, a little Chardonnay -ish. bit of Chardonnay-ish. Is it a Chardonnay-ish? It it's kind of a <laughs> Chardonnay-ish. It's, it's um, really person. in between like Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay. Okay. The, the grape bridal itself is called Macabeo, and it's only made in Spain. Okay. Um, you know, when we look at what we're doing as a company, we try to find things that are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so instead of spending you know, 15 20 dollars on a Chardonnay or a Pinot Grigio, um, this is something that we can get down to the ten dollar price point. So, Thank you. Yeah, okay, so a little so bit more of a bargain for your everyday drinking. The traditional mac and cheese would be this. If we're yep. going to go to some stronger flavors like blue cheese, sure. What are you going to recommend with maybe bacon, uh, you know, crumbles sure. on top? I'd say the second thing that I would do um, on that. You can go either to the bigger Chardonnays. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we talk about, I think of white wines kind of as a progression from lighter to medium to heavier. And so usually you go from like a Chardonnay, this is where this um, the middle Suave mm -hmm. uh, the, goes into a Pinot Grigio, goes into the Chardonnays, Viognier's, ones that have a fuller, heavier body. Mm -hmm. So if you get, um, a, a heavy oak Chardonnay mm -hmm. that would stand right up to there. Sure would. Um, but you go into the red cycle and you got a whole range of rosés, which we've talked about. We you know, have, and rosés, it's perfectly acceptable it today. It is acceptable yeah. to, to okay. have rosé. So you've got that range, but then you have the range of light reds, like a um, Pinot Noir, uh, Gamay Beaujolais, mm -hmm. a couple other uh, light reds that would be able to still stand up to the, that, but not overwhelm the flavor. Okay. You know, you don't want to go all the way to the big side of the reds where no, you got Cabernet and you know, Malbec and, and some of those. Just it's going to be too much. It's, it's not the flavor the right thing. Okay. So let's talk about another comfort food. Sure. Winter comfort food. What else food. are you cooking? Uh, chili. Chili. Um, and we do that for tailgating too. So Absolutely. what do you recommend for chili? And I know some chilies end up with white beans and chicken, but for the traditional red sauce with red meat, what do you say? I'd say you know the best the best bet for regular chili mm -hmm. is something that's going to be pretty medium bodied mm -hmm. and it's going to take a little it's not going to have too much spice in the wine because mm -hmm. you've got the spice you in the chili yeah. so you want to counteract the, the point there um, I like um, one of the grapes that I've chosen okay. here this is a Barbera mm -hmm. this is a Barbera da Asti from um, Piedmont Italy the Quattro Leone uh, 
line of wines from we Castello di Gabbiano. Just love that vineyard, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> we well, they do. get through some really, really great value wines, and um, I like Barbera because it's right in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's a younger drinking wine. Mm -hmm. It's not quite as bold in its tannins. Very fruity. Uh, also goes along the lines of, of a lot of Merlots are this way. Mm -hmm. So that would be another good comparison to use and to, to have with your chili. So you should take a little snip. Yeah. So. Mm. So you get a little bit of that spiciness, but it's not overpowering. It's not, you know, Syrah is kind of known as the spicy mm -hmm. or Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. when you, if you were to have that really spicy mm. Zinfandel or Syrah. It's a light, it, yes. It, this, this actually compares a little bit better to it. And I could understand how it would be a great juxtaposition against the spicy chili. Yeah. So good selection. So, All right. So we, we did the white bean too. The white bean. What would you, know, you say? I'd say the white bean. You know, if you were looking at that, you want to try to go maybe into the Sauvignon Blanc category. Okay. Um, one of the more best crisp. new yeah. crisp white wines. Um, it allows it to have a little more acidity, and so that does the same kind of aspect mm -hmm. that this does, where the red wine's got acidity here. It balances out the uh, the heat in the chili. Right. Okay. So mac and cheese, chili, now stews, and those come in a wide variety. But traditionally, there's usually some tomato base in it, yeah. be it a bouffe bourguignon or be it um, chicken cacciatore. Right. You know, you're, right. you're talking red, and that's a chicken stew. What do you suggest? Well, I think, you know, in that same flavor profile, you need to go ahead and go, all right, are you going to be, A, cooking with wine, okay. or are you going to be preparing um, your dish and having the wine as a compliment. All right, let's, so, yes, let's so, talk about that. So, so two so. different kind of aspects to it. Um, right now, this time of year, cooking with wine, you know, the better wine you have that you cook with, the better your food's going to be. Please, I, please remember that. You need to be able to drink the wine that you cook with. It shouldn't be a separate. Right, and, okay, but it's product. also a really nice way, you know, you got a couple extra bottles you opened up over the holidays and good idea. They'll, they'll stay, stay, stay good for a few extra days. You put them Put a cork in it, put it in the fridge, and then when you're ready to cook that next, say it's the beef bourguignon, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's looking for a dry red wine. Right. You know, you, you've got something that you already know, you've tasted and liked, and it's just a better quality than the cooking wine. Okay, so, so and good we should be doing cooking wine. Okay, so if you're cooking with a wine, is that the wine you want to drink also with the dish? You know, I'd say that that's a... a it's good. It's, it's a good, good way. To, okay. It's a good. It's a good thing to do. You can see the similarities in the meal. You see the similarities with it, um, but it's not. It's not a rule. It's not a rule. Okay. It's a guideline. Okay. So if you. But it's safe. You, yeah, it's safe. It's safe. You know, so if you're going to buy one, bo two bottles. Yes. You you know open one bottle. You use half the bottle in the recipe. Right. You know you you've got that other half to share with your guests, mm -hmm. and you have the other bottle too. Mm -hmm. So it's a good good example of a way to do it. But if you went to something else, you want to try to either stay in the same family, same area. Um, I like to think of it as like if you're doing a light red wine in your sauce, stick with the light red wine right. at, for your dinner. Okay. You know, if you're going to be doing, um, say, a big red wine, so you put um, some Bordeaux or Burgundy, or Burgundy in with, um, you know, something you're cooking, some steak, or your, or you know, even a, um, a red sauce. Uh -huh. You, know, you want to give it a little bit of extra flavor. Then you want to try to stick with those same families, the Burgundy okay. family or the Bordeaux family. Good advice. Not, not necessarily go move from. I cooked with the Pinot Noir, then I had a Cabernet with dinner. That, Not, no. It, it'll just kind of mix and muddle the flavors a bit. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so we've got these uh, good suggestions for the comfort foods that we look forward to in the winter. You know what else happens? Because we are having heartier foods, we're drinking probably, possibly, a little possibly. more you know, red wine. Knows? And the spills. I happen and so now you're supposed to help us figure that out what do we do okay so there's there's a couple things okay. and these you know there's you could probably go on the internet and see that there's tales mm -hmm. of all kinds other uh, tales yes um, but um, there's a couple things that I think are really good good ideas to try one is if you do get red wine say you get red wine on, on your a beautiful white, white shirt, shirt or your you linens know, or you've got um, washing it out with a little bit of white wine is a good way to try oh to, to kind of wash okay. it out. Right. If you try to use water, it doesn't have enough um, viscosity to it. Okay. And so it just kind of 
walks around it, and okay. the white wine gets in there with it, um, just the same way that soda water does. Okay. And this is one of the products I always have around okay. my house. What it's, is it called? Uh, it's called Wine Away. Wine Away, okay. And it literally, um, when you put it on the stain, uh -huh. it will uh, take that stain out of your clothing. Oh, wow. Um, it's... I, I'm not working for the company or anything, no, okay. but I do but say that this not, one works. You know that so. that works. Okay, so you know a great gift to go along with that bottle of wine and perhaps some chocolate. And no fear, you know, you can get the stain out. Yeah, yes. perfect. Good little gift for Valentine's Day. Well, you've done wonderful research, not only for how to care for the wines, but even in selecting them. And Wine Spectator has recognized your efforts with great awards over the last five years, best value. How do you make this happen? Well, you know, we've gone through a, um, a, a large selection process to make sure that we find the best values, unique varietals, you know, like these two that are, right. um, you know, not the, the big best sellers in the market, but offer something new for, for wine lovers to take a look at. So each of the wines we pick, we do a blind tasting to make sure that it's better than its market competition. and. The, the core that goes through all of our wineries that they have a green, sustainable, um, thank you for that earth-based focus, and so that's really nice, you know, to say, look, all of these people are working to make sure that they're having a smaller impact um, on the globe. So and providing a, a good place to live for the children that we're bringing up now. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. So, you know. so how can people learn more about your portfolio? Again, unique wines. You're, they're not the usual that that you think about, but the care you've taken in identifying these small wineries that love the earth and love the wine they're making. Well, how can we learn about your portfolio? Well, what you're looking for is um, the two words, Marquee Selections, okay. and our website's only got one, so um, www.marquee.com -E is where you can go, and we've got uh, all the social media giants on there, Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. all of those. So if you want to sign up there, you can kind of see and keep up with what's going on with us. But we also have a list of locations and places that you can find, you can uh, find the, wine. the wine in. So okay. we'd be happy to have you stop by and become one of our friend, fans <laughs> and friends. Okay. So to your health, I should say next week we're going to talk about Closures. Yeah. Well, there's a big debate on that. We're going to talk about it. We're going we're gonna to break the, uh, break the seal, so to okay. speak. Okay, we're going to break the seal to your Cheers. house.